Hello, everyone. Welcome to those of you joining in. We'll just leave, uh, we'll get started in half a minute. I'm just going to slowly admit people who are, who are coming in now. Welcome, everyone. Just some quick housekeeping before we get started. Um, please note that we are recording this event. If you do not wish to have your face or name showing, please feel free to change your name in uh, the participant list now. You can click the dot, dot, dot next to your name and rename yourself. Um, we will not be sharing the chat or the participant list with anyone publicly. Um, for the protection of our speakers today. Some folks will be using pseudonyms and we appreciate that you don't ask for people's names as well. Um, in the beginning, we will start with presentations from our student researchers. And later on, we will shift into breakout groups and the more participative chat. Um, so initially, please do keep yourself muted if you are not speaking. And then later on, there'll be plenty of opportunities for you to turn your cameras and mics on if you wish to do so and actively participate. But initially, please do keep your microphones off. Um, when we are in the breakout groups, please note that those won't be recorded. So you can feel free to, to speak as freely as you wish. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, M Messina Lorette Manirakiza, to kick off uh, the event today. And Claudia Meyer, who will be our graphic recorder, illustrating all of the stories that are shared today. So I'll stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you now, Claudia and Messina. Thanks. Thank you so much, Melissa. Good afternoon or oh, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to this webinar. We are delighted to have you as part of this conversation on the social contract of citizenship after the 2021 coup in Myanmar. My name is Messina Loret Manirakidza, and uh, I work for the Knowledge Platform Security and, and Rule of Law. For those who might not be familiar with uh, KPSRL, it is a network of experts uh, working on generating, sharing, interrogating, and applying evidence in the field of security and rule of law. Today, we have the pleasure and the privilege to be co-hosting this webinar with the Virtual Federal University, VFIU, and the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion, ISI. In a few minutes, we'll get the opportunity to hear key findings uh, from the project Reimagining the Social Contract of Citizenship in post coup Federal Myanmar, which is a joint project by VFIU and ISI. The project was supported by the Knowledge Management Fund, which is the network instrument to financially support activities arising uh, from network members. The aim is to diversify thinking and evidence in the security and rule of law field, particularly in fragile and conflict affected settings. So this project engaged with last year knowledge platform thematic headline, which was reimagining social contract in fragile and conflict affected states, and throughout the year, we had the opportunity to explore via projects, via events, and via an annual conference, theoretical and practical implications of social contract concept in fragile and conflict-affected settings. So um, today, we will um, we have the opportunity to delve deep, deeper into this uh, specific project findings. And we'll also have an interactive uh, moment, both in plenary and breakout groups. I won't take much of your time. Again, welcome. I'll now hand over to Natalie from ISI. We'll take it from here. Natalie, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also going to keep this really brief, and I have a very good reason for that. Um, I want to give as much space as possible for the student researchers' work. And actually, that's what this project has really all been about. Um, the four community level research projects were entirely student led. Our role has been to facilitate that process and to support the development of their skills. The student researchers have done such an incredible job under extremely challenging circumstances, um, developing themselves, contributing to the resistance movements in Myanmar, um, while they're also directly affected by the conflict and forced displacement there. 
Um, at ISI, we've learned so much. Providing space for local knowledge production requires us, by which I mean the broader international human rights community, to reflect on the value that we assign to local knowledge. Um, and reflect on power relations and to remind ourselves that the real expertise in human rights work lies with the communities in struggle. And on that point, I'd just like to extend a massive thank you to the team at um, KMF for not only providing this opportunity, but also for understanding the intrinsic value of placing process before output and for centering the voices of young people affected by conflict. Um, I also want to make a very brief point relating to social contracts. When we think of social contracts, we tend to think of the relationship of society with the state. Um, and as uh, the international human rights community, we tend to frame our advocacy work around states and sometimes become stuck in a statist prism. Um, but what happens when the social contract between society and state institutions entirely collapse? Where does that leave our work? Well, this is the question that we in uh, ISI have, bit, have sort of struggled with in the context of Myanmar and in the context of our Rohingya work. And the student researchers has, have really helped us to rethink the theories of change that inform our Myanmar advocacy work. I really hope that this session can also help others of you um, to think through these issues in the context of your own work. Um, thank you. I will hand over to the BFU team. Thank you so much um, to KMF, uh, KPSLR and ISI for their support uh, to the Virtual Federal University with this project. And especially thanks to Natalie for that uh, beautiful introduction and to all your support to the student researchers and to me and to KZAC during this uh, time. So I'm Dr. Hilary Faxon. I'm today wearing my hat as a member of the steering committee of the Virtual Federal University which was founded in the aftermath of the 2021 military coup in Myanmar when the military junta, the state administrative council, dismissed a lot of teachers and professors, disrupted basic and higher education, and also prompted many students and educators to go on strike and refuse to work for the junta. So we're just one of several educational collectives that are looking for solutions that can help to build um, a future federal democracy in Myanmar through critical education that empowers our students um, and um, brings in allied educators from around the world to teach courses online, um, to work on on the ground education, which is an urgent need, um, and also to do this type of action research. So I'm really excited to get a chance to introduce our students today who are members of our action research program. Like VFU itself, this is a program that was initiated by students inside Myanmar. So my role is to support and enable them. And we've been running this program for a bit over a year now. The students um, have chosen uh, the topics of their studies and they bring their own embodied knowledge, their research questions, and their commitment to doing the type of research that can enact change towards a better, uh, fairer, and more democratic and just society. So our first batch of students uh, did four projects, sorry, three projects, which were focused on student activism. And uh, there's an article from that work coming out soon in the Independent Journal of Burmese Scholarship. And this is our second batch who worked uh, with Natalie on this research about social contracts. So I'm going to turn it over um, to our VFU research coach, Kazak. Kazak has worked with these students um, for about uh, nine months. Many of them took Natalie's course on citizenship and statelessness before that. Um, but since about October, the students have been working together for training on research methods, to develop proposals, uh, which were reviewed by a team of academic advisors with expertise in these topics and methods, and then to conduct data connect collection and analysis. So we're really excited to share some of the key findings from that today with all of you. And I'll turn it over now to Kazak. Thank you, Hilary. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the event today. I'm Kazak, a research coach for this program. So now uh, I'm going to introduce uh, their research team now. 
um, and they are all together 12 researchers in this project. So they, they are from the students, some, some of them are from the student unions who joins uh, civil disobedience movement and some are from the conflict affected areas of Myanmar. So with their embodied knowledge, experience, uh, they co-conduct an excellent community-led research. So there are four research under this project. The first one is access to education of children and IDP camps. Uh, this is the case study in Southern Shan State. This, is, uh, this was conducted by Hantu R, Fiona and Cora. So uh, let me mention here, uh, some, there are uh, 12 researchers, but some can join today and some cannot. So, and then uh, the second theme is uh, the violation of citizenship rights from the most conflict affected areas of Myanmar. This was also uh, done in Karani and Sakai Amakwe. So uh, this was conducted by Chris and Gloriosa and also Lipo. And then the third theme is uh, becoming migrants and losing citizenship rights uh, after the COP. This is also a case study in Mesa of Thailand. So this was done by Heyman and Rick. And the last term is uh, become, uh, you belong with me, sorry. You belong with me is uh, it's a survey research. So it was done by uh, Yang Chi, Tweta and Sumya Tanda. So uh, they are also going, they are now going to present their, yeah, their research findings. So this is time for the, yeah, yeah, for their, yeah, for, for, for their presentation. So uh, let me check with Hillary. So are we going to start the presentation now? Yes, why don't we get started with the access to education team? Yes, thank you. So let me invite access to education team. If Fiona and Cora. Yes. Uh, thank you for today. Yeah, uh, let's get started. Our research paper name is Access to Education or Chairing and ITP Can, a case study in Southern Shia State. Our team member are Gohan Chua. Onia and me, Cora. And uh, firstly, we will introduce about the background situation in Myanmar since February 1st, 2021, uh, military coup happened and uh, there's uh, so many violations of rights, mostly in conflict area. We focus on this topic to know the situation of education and assets, freedom of movement and resident of NDP children when they return to their home. Uh, to analyze whether the laws require document to get formal education or not, and thirdly, to explore the right to education and citizenship right or the chairing. And finally, uh, we focus on this topic to get responsible person or organization or media notice the cases and get some hair for them like uh, this kind of webinar here. Yeah. And our uh, main research question is, what are the challenges and uh, how will they affect the right to education, freedom of movement, and resident or NDB chairing in Southern Shan State? Yeah, uh, we use qualitative uh, method for the research and uh, KII method, phone call interview, and in-person interview are included in the research. And uh, now we will present about the finding path. Uh, there are so many interesting findings in, for the, the research. And now we were present in six parts. Uh, firstly, find out how did they arrive at the camp and how do they live in the camp. And for the second, how the children are learning uh, for the third, they are also right. And for food, uh, they are access to education for non ITP chairing. And for fit, they are challengers. And uh, finally, 
free imagination or the citizenship. Yeah. And uh, for the first point, how did they arrive the camp and how do they live in the camp? Uh, Timosu, Pekong, and Mobe are the most conflict affected area in Kaya uh, Kayini state. Uh, we, we also call Kayini uh, state uh, for Kaya state. And most people from this state are uh, moved to the Shan state uh, for their safety. Some parents sent their children to the INTP camp in charge for their education, uh, security, and safety. And some parents are staying in the city or uh, in the city in Shan Kaya Pora town. Yeah. Uh, some respondents are sharing their home with two or three other families. They are sharing like uh, the same house uh, about two or three families. And they have, they do not get uh, financial support from uh, other uh, organization. Yeah. Uh, the respondents are worried about being arrested by the authority and general forces. Children are also have trauma and most of them were scared about what will happen they were arrested by the military. And uh, for second part, how the children are learning. Uh, for the education of the children and IGP camp, uh, not all the student respondents are not enrolled in the state. Uh, they are learning, they, they continue their education in the church, uh, church uh, like informal style. Uh, the teacher in the church get, uh, teach them with the textbook and they, they, they don't have any support from, from the Ministry of Social Affairs and Resettlement. Uh, this ministry is controlled by the military general. Uh, they follow the education system or the national unity government. Uh, Ministry of Education or the National Unity Government deliver teacher training for them. And uh, they are facing many challenges like uh, uh, they face assigning the right class, uh, the sharing for uh, in uh, the sharing don't know when when classes they should join, what class they should join, yeah. And they, they do not, uh, they are facing challenges they, in learning, yeah. This is informal learning, so they don't know what classes they should join. And for the loss of right, uh, it is really clear that there are so many violations of children's rights and education right, the children are not able to leave their unsafe place and continue their formal education. Uh, for the rest of our presentation, uh, Mafonia will continue, yeah. Hello. Yes, thank you, sister. Uh, so hello, everyone. I would like to continue our presentations under the topics of the rest of the findings. I would like to discuss about the challenges of the people we interviewed. First, some CDMers who were also IDPs found it challenging to find a job because their background work in public offices, which made it difficult for employers to recruit them. And the donder threatened the employers about hiring them. And second, for the students and teachers, there were not enough curriculum resources in both camps. And the teacher made copies of the textbooks donated by UNICEF. Children also found it challenging to learn subject written in English. And third, there was some support from national unity government, such as the online delivery of teacher training courses uh, mentioned uh, sister before, as 
um, the training courses for the school curriculum and the acceptance of examinations and evaluations. In this point, teachers, students, and parents are happy to have received recognition from NUG side, but there was also concern for their safety. And finally, the local authorities were unable to help, but they tried to use threats and coercion by forcing people to return their homes instead of supporting their needs for food and water. And some word administrator understood and allowed them to live, but there was no guarantee of safety. And for the reimagination of citizenship, I would like to mention about one of the uh, quotes from our participants. She said, to become the citizen, as others do, it is not easy to become a citizen of Myanmar without demerit. And that, that is her feelings about being a citizen. She wanted to live in a country with full enjoyment of human rights and dignity. And one of the parents felt that children were deprived of their rights and she wanted peace in the country. One of the CDM teachers thought that their documents could become the evidence of being IDPs and not having the freedom of movement to the areas that would be better for the future. And they were born in the country and they consider themselves as citizens. As citizens, they wanted to have freedom of choice in what they wanted if their age and basic needs were sufficient. They also believe that uh, not only children, but also young people should have full civil rights and mainly that they should have more or less equal employment opportunities. As a citizen, they want to travel freely within the country and they also did not want to report get slaves to what administrators. According to their interviews, many people were living in fear. Uh, as our recommendations, uh, there is need for the new system of citizenships. It is a question that national ID became a threat for them. And speaking of language difficulties, they seem to want to use Burmese more than their mother tongue. Whether ethnic groups other than majority Burmese had forgotten to consider the possibility of their mother tongue, disappearing should be questioned. And the tests and evaluation sets are uh, too strict for the children. And there should be some kind of age-based class allowed but having the terms and conditions of recognition from both sides are not feasible for both parents and children. And also, is it necessary for the children in uh, the non-former education community uh, who are not, uh, who have not been recognized by both sides? And also there should be some kind of, um, um, some of the areas of unrest continue, that the education of the future children of the country will continue to be worse. And civic rights will continue to be lost due to political debt lots and intimidations. Uh, in conclusions, um, according to the social contract theory, we think we only have the agreement between our local people by ourselves. Uh, for example, uh, we, the people uh, around us and the church churches have to support the IDPs uh, for food security and some stationaries for education, but uh, they are not enough. And um, there are some supports from UNESCO and New Humanity Myanmar for the salaries of the teachers teaching in the camps. Uh, so the social contract between the authority is totally broken 
as they don't want to recognize they are IDB camps in our areas. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona and Cora, for your excellent presentation. Uh, this is an important research in this second step. So I hope yeah, the audience will have many questions on it for Q&A session. Now, let me invite next team, Gloriosa and Chris, to present their findings on the study of violation of citizenship rights uh, from the most comforted in post-COVID Myanmar. Um, hello, everyone. <clears throat> hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Kazak. Yes. Uh, what about Gloriosa and Chris? Can you hear me? They are also from the yeah, most conflict affected area. They are living there now, so their connection is not stable. If um, if Chris and Gloriosa are having difficulty connecting, we can also go to the next group and try again um, in a few minutes for them. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me check. Yes, we can do that. I will. Yeah, I will trying with them privately for that. So. Now we can go to next time. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I see Gloriosa now. Uh, let me check it again. Gloriosa, can you hear me and can you present now? Okay. Okay, yes, let's move on uh, to the migrant teams. Uh, Hima and Rick, are you ready to present? Yes. Okay, so yeah, now uh, let me invite you two to present your present uh, uh, findings of your research. Um, thank you very much. Hello, everyone, can you hear me well? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so um, hello everyone. This is Rick from the uh, migration team, and we study on the loss of citizenship of Myanmar migrants in Myanmar South. And first, I would like to talk about forced displacements in Myanmar. Uh, forced displacement has been a significant result of historical and political issue uh, by means like ongoing conflicts within the countries between the militaries and the ethnic M groups, a major example being Rohingya 2017 crisis where a million of Rohingya migrated to Bangladesh due to prosecution and violence. Another example being where 100, 100,000 and thousand of individuals being displaced in Kachin cities. And now because of the coup, um, there is also a displacement, displacements of people owing to the fact of the participations in the civil, dis civil disobedience movements and protest. And this display, these dis displaced people are in denial of their rights and necessities, and they also face discriminations and by violence. And this have long term mentally and physically affect on impact on them. The, the effects on the existing, there are there is uh, there i mean sorry uh, there are also um, effects on 
existing social and cultural structure as well. And that's why the sustainable solutions are required. And these are the facts which invoke our interest to do our research. Next, um, our research focused on Myanmar migrants fled to Mesa after the coup. And our, uh, uh, and our, our questions emphasizing on loss of their civil uh, civil rights, uh, uh, civil rights um, um, among the migrants, and we perform in-depth interviews with nine Myanmar migrants from different backgrounds, and we use a qualitative way to understand their experiences and opinions. And we also study uh, the podcast of AWO, an organization which helps migrants workers um, in mass out. And, and our findings can be used as a supporting data for people who are planning to migrate uh, to mess out Thailand and in, in able to, and also in order to reflect the challenges. Um, next, uh, I would like to talk about our findings and there are two parts. Um, the first uh, is like, um, the first is, the part is discussing, uh, discussing uh, their migra migration experience, and the next is uh, their views on um, their citizenship, which is Myanmar citizenship procedure. And um, our interviewees uh, includes uh, former government employees, politically active students, and people who participated in anti-dictatorship anti movements. And first they migrated internally and later they crossed the border between Myanmar and Thailand. Uh, along the way, they experienced uh, ins um, uh, insecurities uh, and stress of being arrested whenever they arrive at the military checkpoints. And also there are a case of these uh, military uh, forces in search of their personal information, such as asking, asking for their phones and etc. And some of them have to pay bribes to ease this scrutiny. And um, one man could migrate with the help of uh, someone who seems to uh, know how to get uh, getting people out of the country. And we also found out that after COVID and COOP, people had to cross uh, illegally, uh, he, people had to cross uh, and migrate illegally to the neighboring countries. And also, and they also had to pay exorbitant fees um, to the brokers, had to leave their belongings behind while, while they have to cross the legal of the, the border. And some, uh, are, there are some encounters with the police and, and had to hide in cramped in uh, overcrowded condition. And next, um, uh, there, there are some people who um, expressed that they might had, that they had been trapped Profited by the, uh, the by the brokers, and and one us uh, and some of them said that uh, one, uh, one one of our interviewees, which is a, a, a former health worker, uh, said that she had to stay in the house with, on a fan with her husband, and they had to only had to um to be in the single a single clothes alone for many hours because they are. Um, clothes are wet. And next, uh, the living condition, uh, I would like to talk about the living condition. Uh, one of our interviewees said that uh, he had to quit his job because of low amount of wages. And, um, and uh, after that job, he uh, had uh, he studied uh, the sewing business, but he couldn't do it publicly, publicly because of uh, the, uh, uh, publicly because of their illegal status. Um, our interviewees had to face many challenges, like in securing accommodations, finding jobs and language difficulties. And the main challenges is lack of official documents, 
And they also had to worry about getting arrested, arrested or fire, fine by um, Thai authorities. And because of their lack of uh, these official documents, they can't work in the former economic, economical background, receive medical treatment in um, government hospitals and, and access to education. And there is a, a interview, a interviewee, a woman talk about her job in securities where she she had to avoid police whenever she has to go out to sell her or maybe do her job. Uh, 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 she goes out to work. And another says that she didn't earn as equally as her husband, which uh, he earned around 100 bucks while she only earned 15 bucks even though she had to work additional work the fees won't add up thank you very much and Hermans will continue the presentation thank you Ruth uh, let me present the other main finding first and discussion first experience of the migrant the interviewee with migrant from Myanmar revealed that many of them had experienced violence and persecution by the junta. Several interviewing have to move from place to place in the country due to feeling and stay in their homes. One man who was interviewed lost his teenage son shared his experience on February 25, 2022. My son was shot and killed on the spot by the military. After this situation, we have to worry about about the safety of our family, and then we went here to avoid them. The majority of migrant interview who fled Myanmar for Thailand continue to face difficult conditions, thought they feel physically safe. Migrants living in hiding said they were still fearful of arrest by Thai authority, but prefer living illegally in Thailand to living in Myanmar. When interviewing know that there was a little bit of law in Thailand, meaning People couldn't be key as they please, which provided a sense of safety. All the interviewee migrants expect a desire to return home, but due to the ongoing violence and oppression by the junta, they felt it was impossible. They expressed psychological trauma due to their homesickness and the difficulty they face in Thailand. The journalists argued that we must escape. It is clear. If we go back now, there are only two try for us that or arrest. And other part is review of Myanmar citizenship process. All the interviewee in this session identified themselves as Myanmar citizens based on their bed and SSD in Myanmar, despite lacking official citizenship documentation. A CDN policeman argued that we, government and Brian, are much worse. We have to go through our whole life with overdone over orders from senior officer, forced labor, and so much more. Many interviewees felt that citizenship should not be based on ethnicity or religion, but rather individuals should have the freedom to choose their own belief. Many felt that a new citizenship law should be drafted to address this issue. A university student also expressed her opinion on citizenship rights. I think it is something we are born with, and therefore, we should not have to ask this from anyone else. If we have to ask for it from someone else, we can assume that the power lies with that person. Then we are not getting it, and we are losing everything. Respondent what a system that fully grant citizenship right without restriction and provide full rights and human dignity to every citizen from bed. Discussion that full displacement in Saudi Asia is called by a complicated historical and political backdrop, which include conflict, colonialism, civil war, inter-ethnic and inter-religious tension. Environmental concerns and political leaders using forced displacement as a strategy to solidify their power. In addition, forced migration and politics can result in the deterioration of social structure, cultural tradition, and existing conflicts. Full displacement also had long term effect on an individual mental health and overall well being, in addition to violating human rights. Following the 2021 Myanmar military coup, people have been fleeing to Thailand to escape political persecution, economic instability, and the ongoing conflict between the Myanmar military and ethnic M group. 
many migrants face oppression and labor rights violation in the world place, and they receive limited assistance from international organizations and local NGOs. Politically, Mbawa group had fewer challenges than ordinary citizens who participate in the movement against the military regime. The military dictatorship in Myanmar has been oppressing its people since 1962, with the military and the military conglomerates being the main culprit of human rights violations. To improve the situation, existing law and system causing oppression and discrimination must be dismantled and the right of all people, including ethnic groups, civil rights, and human rights must be ensured through inclusive coloration. The military digital shit and its supporters must be dismantled from the root to establish a federal system and democracy in Myanmar. Please let me start my presentation here. Thank you so much for your time and listening. Thank you, Hema and Rick, for your presentation. Now, uh, Chris and Gloriosa are back here. So, uh, Gloriosa, are you okay to present now? Can you hear me? Um, yes, Oma. Uh, okay. Um, can you hear me too? Um, yes. One, um, this, this group. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, this is Gloria, and I'm going to make a presentation uh, on behalf of our current team. Um, ship rights from the most conflicted areas in post group Myanmar. Okay, now, <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to expose the idea and the motivation that inspired us to make this research. Is that like uh, all of the members of this Kareni team are in Kareni frontline areas in Myanmar? So <laughs> we often hear around uh, about uh, the Kareni people struggling to get out of the state or getting detained because of their ID cards. Uh, you can also see this news sometimes. Uh, so being the youth who are actually participating in the armed revolution, we decided to leave some reports and the documents as the evidence of the deliberate discriminations of the military group. Uh, so before we go on, uh, I think I need to put on some little information about the citizenship scrutiny class of Myanmar. So um, if you look at the ID card of a Myanmar citizen, you will see, uh, you can see the numbers. Uh, these numbers indicate the origin place of the holder, which means that a holder comes from just by looking at the numbers. For example, like if the number is two, uh, the number, uh, the holder is from Green State. Uh, if number is five, he or she is from Sokai, and number eight means the holder is from Magui Division. In our research paper, you can see the citizenship rights violations from the most conflicted areas in Myanmar, uh, which are Green State, Sokai, and Magui Divisions. Uh, we use the narrative method in this paper because uh, we like to highlight the dis different and distinctive uh, life stories of the interviewees and what they have been through. So, uh, and we could make uh, in-depth interviews with three people from Bernie, Sakai, and McQuay, respectively. Uh, <clears throat> since we used in the narrative, uh, I think it would be of the people that we made interviews with. <clears throat> The first one, the first person is a 47-year-old housewife and also an ITP from Green State. <clears throat> the problem here, combination here we found out is that uh, he, I'm sorry, she and her family were not allowed to pass through. They were on their way to go to their relative home to this place. Uh, the soldiers from that checkpoint make the investigation more than necessary, and all of their questions are concerned with the suspicion like uh, uh, she and her family are the revolutionaries or the PDFs uh, or, or from the People Defense Forces uh, because they came out of the current states. They are actions and the questions of the soldiers uh, only make us question like, 
what the freedom of movement is like under the military coup. <clears throat> the second person from Sakai Division, uh, as soon as the coup happens, uh, he joined his civil disobedience movement and tried applying for different jobs in Yangon rather than going back to his previous job and working under the military coup. So uh, we even gave the title for his life story and the discrimination that uh, we want to highlight. It is um, not getting higher despite qualifications for vacancies. Um, yes, uh, according to the title, we found out that uh, he got denied from 12 positions in different places, uh, that, uh, which even included cleaning service. So the shocking fact is that he got denied only after he was found uh, he was found out through his ID card that he is from uh, Sakai Division. The third one, uh, she is from Magui Division, but now she is working as a garment factory worker in Jiangong. The discrimination here is that uh, she and her friends from Magui are not allowed to uh, directly report the uh, the overnight gas leaks registration by themselves. That overnight gas list registration should not exist in the first place. Uh, it has become real life uh, about two years ago after the facts of the February 2021 coup. Okay, uh, but now here, she and her friends are not allowed to go to the um, uh, administrative office and report the documents themselves because of the recent explosions that happened in that office of how world she is living in. Uh, since the time, uh, just because she and her friends uh, came from Mugui, they are not allowed to do so anymore. So um, <clears throat> this is the brief stories of the interviewees that we made interviews with. Uh, for the findings, uh, we obviously found out from the interviews that um, the coup has deliberately violated the right to freedom of movement, right to work, right to reside within the country, and the right to own property alone and the right to freedom of opinion and expression. Additionally, the coup has brought psychological insecurity, threatening vibes, and uh, like and safety upon the civilians. You can see this in all of the three of the stories of the interviewees. Um, moreover, we found out that the people in ranks, like uh, what administrators, the heads of the streets, the employers, and the host owners, like um, they are the citizens of Myanmar themselves, but uh, yet they are acting as corporate corporates in these cases. Um, they are either voluntarily or involuntarily, or sometimes both, uh, discriminating against the citizens based on their ID cards, and that's exactly what the military wants them to do. <clears throat> if we have to lay down our opinion towards these cases, uh, it is that the standards upon the uh, citizenship rights in post coup Myanmar has um, devastatingly so low, and the soldiers should, back, should be back to their barracks, not in the like uh, investigating checkpoints. And also the discrimination from the top to bottom, bottom uh, command change, as well as um, the military dictatorship itself, uh, are a breach of the international human rights in Shudi Asia, a universal uh, declaration of human rights, and 1982 bomber citizenship law. So <clears throat> um, we, <clears throat> we see that, uh, you can also see that the numbers on the IDB, uh, ID cards themselves is the root that caused these regional discriminations. So uh, finally, uh, as the suggestion, we would like to suggest that these such kinds of region-based discrimination will be elim eliminated only when the numbers indicating uh, once a region place are no longer on the ID curse. Um, <clears throat> the second suggestion we'd like to bring up is that the only solution for the discriminations in this paper, uh, uh, discrimination you can find this, you can see in this paper, is the eradication of the military dictatorship. Uh, <clears throat> the eradication of the military dictatorship will only bring an end to all kinds of discriminations you can ever imagine in post-group Myanmar. Uh, <clears throat> that's all about my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you, Gloriosa. Now, yeah, thank you for your yeah, great presentation. Now, uh, let me invite 
the last term, the survey term, they are research, they are to present their findings or survey research, you belong with me. So if Yang Chi's term is ready. Uh, yes, like he said, thank you. Uh, I think everyone can hear me well. <clears throat> so uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here and your interest in our research. Uh, since we've got a limited amount of time, I will try to explain our research very briefly with some key findings from our survey. I will not cover the whole part of our research in this session, but of course, you're more than welcome to discuss with us in more details about our project, methodology, and motives behind the project in the next session. Uh, let me begin by saying a little bit of research design for our project. Uh, as you may know from the title of our project, we collected a survey from Facebook, which is a very popular social media platform in Myanmar, uh, asking people what they think about citizenship issues in general and incidents of citizenship stripping that happened after the coup in February 2021. But due to the various concerns, including personal security of researchers and respondents, our sample for the survey was very small and now we couldn't do the sampling systematically. So it's not very randomized. And uh, our sample was composed mostly of Burma and Buddhist respondents. But uh, we found out that some of our findings correspond with uh, previous research, survey research did in Myanmar, like Asian Barometer Survey. And uh, hopefully, you will also find it interesting. Uh, yeah, our survey can be divided into four main sections. I will briefly uh, talk about these things. Uh, in the first part, we ask about respondents' awareness regarding to citizenship stripping in general and incidents of citizenship stripping in Myanmar. And we ask them what they thought of citizenship stripping and cases they have heard of in Myanmar. And one key finding was that half of the respondents did not know about the cases of citizenship stripping in Myanmar. And uh, majority respondents with the knowledge about these incidents of citizenship stripping mentioned uh, people related to the uh, National Unity Government, NDG, some social media influencers and activists who got their citizenship revoked after the coup in 2021. And that was the first part. And then the second part, uh, respondents were asked for their evaluation upon the various grounds of defining citizenship and grounds for stripping them. Uh, for example, we asked what they thought of uh, granting citizenship only to those who were born from parents of one of the uh, ethnic groups in Myanmar. And we also want quite controversial by asking them a uh, hypothetical question, of course, uh, would they agree to granting citizenship to those whose DNA match with assembled DNA of ethnic groups in Myanmar? And the results showed that majority of respondents did not agree to limit citizenship in Myanmar only to ethnic groups. And uh, we also included some questions based upon some of the provisions from 1982 citizenship law in Myanmar. And we asked them what they thought of stripping citizenship of someone who held uh, citizenship of another country simultaneously or who left the country permanently. Those were the uh, clauses used by the hunter to uh, strip the citizenships of the people after the coup. And the majority of respondents also disagree on these terms as well. But uh, these uh, seemingly inclusive opinions changed when it comes to the questions related to security related matters. For example, we asked them, would they agree to revoke citizenship of someone who participated in international terrorist organizations or who, uh, who threatens national security? The views became more uh, restrictive by about half of respondents agree to strip citizenship on these grounds uh, that that's the second part. And then in the uh, third session of our survey, we asked them about migration. 
we ask some hypothetical questions like would they agree to accept immigrants who have been displaced by climate change or socioeconomic troubles in their origin countries? The majority of respondents agree to welcome migrants into Myanmar. This finding shows similarity with those from other survey research conducted in Myanmar before. Uh, for example, in the last Asian Barometer survey in 2019, they asked the similar questions and it showed that half of its uh, respondents supported uh, immigration to Myanmar. And then in the last session, we, uh, we tried to find respondents priorities for defining uh, grounds for citizenship in Myanmar. And we gave them options such as citizenship by marriage, citizenship by birth, citizenship by family, so forth. And the findings showed that two options, mainly citizenship by birth and family, were the most famous, uh, most favorite uh, categories for respondents for defining citizenship in Myanmar. And uh, one option that defines citizenship by terms of ethnicity was selected only by a quarter of respondents. That's why uh, we assume that respondents preferring citizenship by birth and family over other categories. Uh, they were given might have to do with their uh, sufficient amount of knowledge regarding to various different types of grounds for defining citizenship. Uh, from these findings, we conclude that defining citizenship by ascriptive characteristics, uh, which means ethnicity in our research, is not very popular among our respondents. Of course, it's not very representative of the population in Myanmar. Our respondents tend to hold quite flexible and inclusive perceptions towards citizenship. However, they suddenly became less inclusive when it came to security matters and stripping citizenship on the grounds of these uh, security reasons. But notwithstanding these findings, there is also one finding in our survey that reflected the current mode of public attitudes to uh, participation in decision making process. In, uh, in parallel with uh, people's struggles for democracy in Myanmar, we put a question asking them of the role of public in the decision making relating to the uh, citizenship matters in Myanmar. And, and uh, about 90% of respondents agree for public participation in the decision making process. However, uh, since our survey is largely descriptive, we couldn't answer the questions like why respondents hold inclusive and participatory modes of thinking in some areas, but not in the others. Would there be any impacts from elites and their entities such as the media, frames and narratives from opinion leaders? or what could be the role of these frames upon public opinions towards citizenship issues in Myanmar? Yeah, these are the questions we like to suggest to consider, to be considered in further research with the much, much better, bigger sample size and more systematic sampling designs. Experimental design method could be an option to answer these kind of more explanatory questions and and cover the causality behind variations in public attitudes towards these various citizenship grounds that we uh, look to do. Yeah, that's it. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> thank you, Yangji, for your presentations. Um, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, every presenter, for this presentation. And thanks for sharing your interesting and important findings of your research. Um, from now on, uh, for Q&A session, let me hand this event over to Hilary. Thank you. Thanks so much. So um, before we move into the breakout rooms and have an opportunity to talk directly to the student researchers, um, I thought I would turn it over to Natalie for a moment just to say a few words about the broader context of citizenship in Myanmar, since we've had a number of questions in the chat. And maybe while Natalie um, provides a little bit of background on that, I can also invite if others have general questions about the context of the research or, um, or of citizenship, please go ahead and add those in the chat. We'll take a few minutes just to field those high level questions uh, before moving into breakout rooms. 
Thanks, Hilary. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, perhaps direct the questions um, towards the students' research more. Um, there's heaps of brilliant resources out there on the um, 1982 citizenship law. The students' research was not really to look into the law. Um, it was to look into um, the social contract um, and to look at uh, the different forms of discrimination that um, people were facing um, as citizens of, of Myanmar. Um, the, the project, I think, is useful to have a bit of a background, which is that the project arose originally because ISI works on statelessness. Um, we had a lot of projects that were working on Rohingya issues. Um, and it became evident as we moved on that there were lots of issues related to the weaponization of ID card systems and the weaponization of citizenship that were affecting um, broader populations in Myanmar, um, particularly minorities or people who are affected by forced displacement. Um, and these issues really came to a head um, after the coup. And we have like, you know, a whole, within Burma studies, a whole world of, of expertise on the law. But what we were sort of missing from the equation was that really local um, community level research. And so if you do have questions about the sort of broader context, et cetera, please do dig into those resources. There's some great ones that have been put in the chat. Um, and, uh, you know, think about your sort of community level questions for, for the students as we move into the breakout rooms. Thanks. I hope that's what was uh, useful for you. Thanks so much, um, Natalie. I see one more question in the chat from Elliot that maybe I'll address briefly as we transition towards the breakout rooms. Just to say that, um, as Natalie said at the beginning, I don't think the use of social contract here is a is implying a role of the state as a protector or um, a beneficiary. I think the students' research really shows that this is about the ways that people work together within a uh, context of a overbearing or violent state. So while I think the points are really good and I would invite the students to talk about how they understand the term social contract or how they understand the term citizenship rights in their context in the breakout sessions. Um, I think that this term is uh, sort of maybe about um, opening up that investigation and also providing a link to the humanitarian community. I know we have many people here from UN agencies and other groups that use the term social contract or citizenship rights um, a lot in their work. So we're trying to find a way to bridge uh, those humanitarian communities and the students' experiences on the ground. But I'm not the expert in that, uh, really our students are. And I think the phenomenon they're describing, whether it's uh, migrant experiences in Thailand or IDP experiences in Shan State are actually quite diverse from each other across the four studies. So with that, I wanna um, invite our moderators to send us into the breakout rooms. We're going to do this with random assignments. So sorry for the fact that you might be really curious to talk to one team and you might end up somewhere else. You can always message the moderator if you have a very strong preference about um, who you get to speak with. But our goal here is really to enable a little bit of conversation uh, between the students and the audience. Um, in this case, the students are our teachers. Um, so I would invite uh, questions about the research, uh, the motivations for the study, the key findings, the big surprises. And I would just also remind the audience that our students are using pseudonyms. Many of them are active in community-based work and protecting their safety and security is our number one priority. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and move into breakout rooms and continue the conversation there. Great, I'll open those in just a moment, Hilary. So we'll have the breakout groups open for 15 minutes. So uh, I'll broadcast a message to everyone when we're wrapping up. And if you had, again, a strong preference to be in a particular group, you can just feel free to directly message me in the chat. All right, opening the rooms now.
Hi again, everyone. Are we all back? Or are we still waiting for, let me see, 3940. I think we are a good group. I just hope you had nice conversation within your respective breakout uh, groups. Um, mine was actually pretty interesting. Uh, for the sake of time, I would like now to invite designated rapporteur if you could share with us one or maximum two highlights of your conversation in terms of uh, way forward. I will uh, start with uh, the group which was discussing the research project on becoming migrants. Kinzin, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, yes. Yeah, in, in our session, yeah, one interesting point is, uh, yeah, we discuss uh, whether uh, we should define uh, the people from Myanmar and mess out, of, yeah, who migrate after the coup. So whether sh uh, we define as the migrants or refugee. So there, yeah, this was an uh, interesting discussion. The other point is like, uh, for this is this can be the questions for every research. What will we do with this information? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that one came also up in our group. Maybe to uh, continue with the group, our group who was discussing about uh, EU Belong project about uh, stripping of citizenship because it's it's a nice transition. Um, there was the, the key question uh, which was posed was about okay, uh, what's next? What are the the recommendations, but our key discussant actually share that for the moment, given the, the difficult context in Myanmar and given the fact that most of the research are sort of high level, you know, done by UNs or uh, other big organization, it is really, really important to make sure that this public opinion uh, types of research are done, community led uh, researchers to make sure that, um, public opinion is, 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 is known, um, people get the opportunity to actually ex express themselves on those key questions like, like citizenship before thinking about diving directly into advocacy or, or policy. So again, as you were saying, what, what's next? Yes, let's do this types of exercises as much as possible, although it's not always easier in the specific context of, of Myanmar. And then once we have the research, let's think maybe in terms of advocacy and, and policy making who we should uh, reach out to. Yeah. With that, let me move with the next uh, group. Just coming back on. I can chime in from the access to education group. Yeah, Larry. So we also had a really rich uh, discussion. Thank you to the great questions and also to the researchers. Uh, one thing that really struck out to me is the uh, emotional experience of doing this research. Uh, so for both of the researchers in our team, the topic, uh, the choice of topic didn't so much come from this new term of the social contract, but it came from their embodied experience as teachers and um, seeing needs on the ground and wanting to create, a, investigate that and have a new vocabulary for describing the problems that they saw. But uh, the experience of doing this work in IDP camps and through interviews was really challenging and um, sometimes heartbreaking. So we talked a little bit about uh, the emotion of doing research and also the challenge of writing about that. Um, especially in uh, not native language or to a policy audience and trying to uh, honor the stories that you hear in research. Great. Thank you so much, Hilary. And then last one, Natalie, on violations. Uh, no. This is um, right. Unfortunately, which is probably illustrates the um, struggles to get this research done very well. Um, we lost both of the um, group we lost their connection unfortunately so the group was stuck with uh you know me talking um <laughs> but what we covered was um a very important point was you know we're doing this uh uh in english and of course 
how does it go out to the affected people and is it going in the right languages um, and will it be disseminated so um, I was saying that yes it will it's been a very tight um, time frame and uh, the Burmese versions will be done as well and uh, keep an eye on the VFU um, website and social media channels for that um, so we look forward to that yeah um, and the other the other thing we we talked about was um, that this is a very um, shared experience. Um, the people being discriminated against because they're um, from the conflict zones, um, and that this is a sort of interesting area to follow up. I think, and the the, the student group has put it in a framework that makes it quite. Um, you know, accessible to people wanting to sort of look more into that um, experience. Yeah. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you all for your great contributions. I think uh, there are interesting highlights from the whole conversation, both in terms of presentations, but also breakout. First of all, in terms of format, uh, because this this was a community-led researcher, I think, as it has been mentioned at the beginning, the beauty of this is to see uh, the people uh, affected by a specific crisis, by a specific uh, issue leading themselves. Uh, uh, this research is, is, is great and really, sheds the light on the opportunity of uh, indigenous knowledge and indigenous skills in terms of research, in terms of uh, helping the other members of the community to actually understand some, some of the con concepts which might be theoretical or unknown, uh, but which actually touches on, on the core of their rights and, and, and duties uh, as, as a member of, of a community, of, of a country. Of course, this is also a bit difficult for a couple of reasons. First of all, technically, language, um, do we, which, which, which language do we want to use? This also is difficult because, because of the context, which is still quite uh, uh, tensed uh, in country. This is also difficult because it's, it, it brings an emotional angle to the conversation and to the research, and it's not always easy to research um, matters uh, which are um, quite um, so or close to, to our hearts. But still, I at least uh, listening to the students, I think uh, um, it's, 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 it's worth investing uh, into um, this type of exercises. Um, Content-wise, I think on one hand, uh, we heard um, how um, displacement, securitization, persecutions, collapsing of state institutions really created a crisis of legal uh, identities in which people um, in country are no longer documented or, or registered, which obviously uh, do place them at a greater risk in terms of statelessness. On the other hand, I think we've also heard about difficulties faced by those who supposedly or maybe technically documented can prove their citizenship, but still are um, having difficulties in terms of accessing their rights as, as, as citizens, uh, especially when they are associated with, with opposition movements. Uh, one uh, key element, especially because we are gathered here as security and rule of law actors, uh, one key element I think to the still is also the role of the international community, the role of international stakeholders uh, in lending legitimacy because sometimes um, international stakeholders may be lending legitimacy to a regime which actually is not enjoying trust and legitimacy of the people it is um, serving. So what do we what do we do in uh, in, in those cases? So um, yeah, I think those are um, highlights and, 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 and questions uh, uh, which uh, remains open for further exploration. I think as it has been mentioned, there is still space to explore, to make sure that uh, public, this types of public opinion research, uh, community-led research um, 
are done uh, to provide the opportunity to people affected by specific crisis to actually uh, type in, share the experiences and actually be able to propose some of the of the solutions, of course, and striking the right balance between gathering, collecting the information, uh, uh, the elements necessary to understand the issue at stake, but also thinking about what types of um, advocacy uh, uh, at the policy level is needed to uh, make sure that um, key questions in the context of post-school Myanmar can be tackled. Um, with that, uh, before I hand over to Melissa, because I know there is a post-survey event, I would like to just quickly check uh, with Hilary or Natalie if there is any final word. Just say a quick thank you uh, for the wrap up and for everybody's participation and also, of course, to our students uh, for being here today late at night with poor connection to share their uh, knowledge with us. Great. And thank you uh, very much. Natalie, go ahead. Sorry, just to add a big thank you to um, Claudia, who's been doing the mapping today. Um, I think that's been a, a new experience for us all, but um, very positive. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you to the team. A great thing. A big thank you to the students. Thank you to Claudia, who was also helping us in terms of um, shaping, capturing key messages. Uh, bear with us for a moment. Uh, and if you could just scan this QR code, Melissa, go ahead and guide us. Yeah, so I sent the link also in the chat, but if you'd rather just take your phone out and take a two to three minute survey from your phone, we really, really appreciate your feedback so that we can continue to make our events better and better. And yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts. So thank you so much. It should also be in your inbox. So I've sent you three different ways to take the survey. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for participating. And again, thanks to the researchers for sharing all of your work with us. We'll follow up with uh, the recording if we end up making it public after. And as Claudia said, we'll add, she'll add some color to the, to the beautiful map and we can share that with you all after the event as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Bye, thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.